In letter 15, screw tape directs Wormwood in terms of how he wants to shape the patient's thinking about the past, about the present, about the future. And of course, this is important because human beings, unlike spirits and unlike God, we live in time. We come out of a past, live through a present, and expect the future. So time is all wrapped up with the way that we think about our lives. This is a very important thing uh, from Screwtape's point of view in, in, in terms of shaping the approach that the patient has to living his life. At the beginning of the letter, he talks about how it is that the patient and all the other human beings, they're all focused on what they call the war. Of course, he's talking about World War II. But Screwtape says this isn't really the war. From Screwtape, from Wormwood, from any devil's point of view, the war is not something that's a particular regional or historical thing that's happening on Earth among human beings. For them, the war is this great war that starts way back before the history of man, when the rebel angels turn against God and establish their own kingdom, and from where they mislead and seduce the human race into sin. That is the war. That is the great war. In Mere Christianity, Lewis will talk about how it is that part of our, our understanding of the cosmos and the social world in which we live as a Christian uh, involves recognizing that we're in enemy-occupied territory. That when Jesus is born in the stable in Bethlehem, that's the beginning of an invasion. And when we go to church, we're hearing these secret radio transmissions from our allies. The rightful king has landed in disguise and he's calling us to aid in the rebellion and the uprising against the prince of this world. And that expression, of course, is right out of the Gospel of John, that the devil has uh, dominion in some way in this world through sin, and that what Jesus does in his birth and then through his work throughout the church is allowing us to share in this conquest, this reconquest of the world that belongs to the rightful king. So, what is it that Lewis is, uh, is saying to us about past, present, and future through Screwtape's advice? Here's something about our own natures, again, that we tend not to reflect on, that we live in time. We, we take it for granted. We don't question being in time any more than fish would question swimming in the water. It's just part of their environment. Our lives emerge from the past through the present and, take play, and, and move toward the future. By contrast, God is completely outside time. That's why we use this expression, eternity, being completely outside time. God wants us to think about eternity. He wants us to live for eternity. But that, of course, is something that's wholly outside our experience. Our experience is all of living in time. How do we put ourselves in such a state that we are fit for eternity? For we're fit for living with God in this state that is outside time. Well, it's not by concentrating on the past. That's over. There's nothing we can do about the past. It's not by looking to the future, which is always out of reach. Rather, our focus, what we're asked to do, is to look at the present. Give us this day our daily bread. Sufficient for the day are the evils thereof. Think not what you are to wear what you are to eat. We are, we are exhorted to look at where we're at now and choose, choose the right path in terms of our present circumstances and our present knowledge. So Screwtape says we need to do the opposite. Since the enemy wants them to focus on the present, we want them to focus on the future because the future is full of possibilities. It's just pure potential. It's the least of all things out there like eternity. And by having them absorbed and obsessed with the future, this is something that can take them away from thinking about what am I doing here, right now? The French writer Blaise Pascal talked about how it is that since we are always hoping to be happy 
and always planning to be happy, we are never thinking of the present. And since our whole thoughts are absorbed in the future, it's uh, inevitable that in all this planning to be happy, that we never will be. A big part of happiness is that we're able to make sense and make the right choices of what's in front of us right now, not what's out in the remote future. So, Screwtape, for example, will talk about how it is that political idealism, communism, or socialism, forms of utopian thinking where you're trying to make a heaven on earth or make a perfect world, you'll so be so fixated on the future that you'll make all sorts of choices uh, that arguably are the wrong choices, that you will justify things that really are not morally or spiritually justifiable because you think that you're working for some sort of inevitable goal, that this is where history is going. There are all sorts of moral compromises you can make if you're sure that this is the direction of history. Now, living for the present, living for the moment, um, that only would be helpful to a devil if it's something that really excludes eternity. And that's usually what people think of, perhaps, when they're thinking about living in the moment or living in the present. Living it in a way in which they don't think about consequences. They don't think about what's going to happen next. That's not what the enemy wants. That's not what God wants. God wants a living in the present, not so much with an eye to the future, but with an eye to eternity. At the end of this letter, we hear for the first time of what he calls the philological arm. Philological is a, uh, describes the origin of words or meaning of words. It's a, it's a branch of linguistics. And what he means by the philological arm is uh, evidently some kind of diabolic, bureaucratic office where what they do is create moral confusion by influencing language. Now, we'll hear more about this later. In the present, uh, in these, in, in the, at the end of this letter, what he wants us to think about is this word complacency. It is in the present that all grace, all duty, all knowledge, all pleasure dwell. And if you can get him to think of this in a bad way by labeling it complacency, you can get him away from focusing on the present in the way he should. How often our language influences the way that we think about things. If we don't have a word, for example, for pride, except of thinking about it in terms of warm-hearted admiration, we're not going to understand pride as a sin. If we don't have a word for vainglory at all, we're not going to be able to understand that that's a sin. One of the remarks that Lewis makes in an essay of his called The Death of Words is that what men have forgotten to say makes it impossible for them to think about. That's something that upon which we should reflect how much our moral and spiritual language is impoverished by the society in which we live and how by reading things like C.S. Lewis and things out of the Christian tradition we're trying to recover this language which then helps us think about the moral and spiritual realities that the, those words describe. Well, in our next letter, we want to look at Screwtape's advice about the church that the patient attends.